Okay. So yes, uh, let's continue where we stop. Uh, were you able to look at that uh, video? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dev. Yeah, yeah. Aran. Okay, great. Wonderful. If you've seen it, it just helps you to get a perspective of how um, loyal the sheep are to the voice of the shepherd. So another context in which, see, Jesus pointed out and said that those who know God, you know, they will understand what God is trying to say. Uh, or the hearts that are um, true and uh, worshipping the Lord, they would recognize that he has, God has sent Jesus to them. But, you know, here, uh, the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, you know, they were acting like uh, the caretakers of, of the people. That is, sheep are God's people, isn't it? So they were acting like they were guiding God's people, they were leading God's people, but they were not leading them in a uh, truthful manner. So here we've seen how the shepherd, he enters by the main gate. Okay? It's only a thief who enters uh, in crooked ways. So the religious leaders of, of uh, uh, those times, they claimed to have a good heart towards the people, unfortunately, uh, you know, that was just a, a superficial commitment which they had for the people. They were more concerned about their own reputation, about their own position, about their own um, security. And that is what Jesus is trying to say when he points out to the shepherd uh, and, and he says that the, uh, the true shepherd, a real shepherd, a good shepherd, will have a heart for the sheep, will know the sheep really well. The way God deals with the sheep. But the so-called religious leaders, they were not being those true shepherds. They did not have the heart of a leader, which they should have had. Now let's continue. Let's see what else Jesus is trying to communicate with the people. Um, so Jesus used this illustration that he comes on to saying that assuredly, most assuredly I say to you, you know, when um, statements like this are made, Jesus is firm about what he's saying. So very clearly I'm telling you, and he's not uh, uh, afraid of making these claims, continuing to make these claims. You know, he said so far, no, oh, I'm the bread of life. Uh, I am the, uh, the uh, what, what did you say? I am that I am, I am the light of the world. The I ams of Jesus, the claims we've seen. Now he says, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is revealing that he is the true path of salvation. He is the true path to the Father. So far, several people, you know, uh, even as you study the history of the Jewish people, there were many leaders who came up and they claimed that they will uh, lead the people to... Uh, uh, you know, God's redemption, salvation, and there were lots of claims and lots of leaders. But what Jesus was saying is, you're saying that I am that true path that will lead you to the Father. And uh, he was clear uh, and not at all shy to claim this. And he says, if anyone enters by me, or in other words, if anyone believes in me, and this is spoken already if anyone believes in him he will be saved and he will go in and find pastor meaning the blessings of salvation will be upon this person's life so he's claiming to be messiah in simple terms then he says the thief does not come now he is contrasting so far when he talked about the shepherd he was uh, yes, he, he was referring to Satan, but he was also referring to the religious leaders of, of uh, those times. 
because they were not leading the people with a good heart but now very clearly you know he's pointing to the enemy satan and he's trying to uh, tell that the thief who brings destruction satan brings destruction and that is why i know jesus is uh, pointing out and he's saying that the thief comes to steal kill and destroy that is satan's work but what does god do what does jesus do and he's saying i've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly so jesus is claim once again he's saying i am the door i have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly so he's speaking about the salvation which he is offering to the people okay uh, an abundant life what is abundant life is abundant life again this is something we can all study uh, does it mean that uh, we have a um, financially prosperous life uh, on the earth that you know we have certain things amenities facilities that make our life better does it mean that or does it mean uh, that you know we have the best life uh, by faith in Christ Jesus and every blessing of the cross is upon our lives so it's not the worldly standards by which we can define abundant life but abundant life is the god kind of life which comes from god you know the satisfaction which comes uh, uh, through the life of god that is the abundant life that um, jesus is talking about over here so he is saying that he indeed is the leader who has a heart for the people okay let's move on let's see what else jesus says till now he said i am the door now he says i am the good shepherd okay i am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep so good shepherd the sheep can be uh, taken care of by any kind of shepherd maybe there's a shepherd who doesn't care much you know leaves the sheep uh, and the sheep get attacked by the wolves but what does a good shepherd do the good shepherd takes very good care of the sheep in what way even through his sacrifice and jesus is actually pointing towards the death that he is going to have very soon uh, for the payment of the sin of mankind so that's why he's saying that he's so good a leader that he is going to lay down his life even for his people so he's saying that uh, he is the good shepherd and his leadership it's very sacrificial okay he is willing to go the extra mile and even uh, you know if it, if it takes death what a great shepherd i, have, I don't know if uh, we have ever seen something like this you know like a shepherd is fighting uh, a wolf or a bear or uh, some other uh, predatory animal that is trying to eat a, a sheep uh, and in the process you know the shepherd gets injured or the shepherd even dies i haven't seen anything like that but i know that if the shepherd really cares for the sheep the shepherd will be willing to do things like this so he's trying to help the people know that he is such a caring god and that he is such a caring leader but again he contrasts it with satan and he says look the hireling he who is not the shepherd one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them so he is saying that satan doesn't care if people are harmed and if you want to apply it to the uh, false leaders who pretend to care for the people of god even they wouldn't care you know they would uh, if any harm comes they are willing to uh, just keep themselves safe safe and escape the scene so that is what a uh, uh, an evil leader would do but what kind of a leader is jesus no he is the one who will lay down his life for the sheep so he say i am the good shepherd and he goes back to what he had said earlier how the sheep know his voice and uh, he the good shepherd knows the sheep by name so he saying look i know my sheep 
and I'm and I'm known by them. So there is a strong relationship which is established, right, between the shepherd and the sheep. Uh, and now, you know, he is going to make a claim which will uh, uh, ruffle the feathers of the religious leaders. He says, as the father knows me and even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So now he's bringing this relationship with the father into the picture, which the leaders never really liked. So uh, he's saying that not only does he have a relationship with the sheep, he also has a relationship with the father. And he claims that there are other sheep you know, who are uh, uh, in, in the world whom he has to bring to the fold. So basically, he was referring to the Gentiles because we know, right? The Bible said that even the Gentiles will come into the fold of God. So Jesus was saying that after he died, the uh, salvation which he brings, it will be offered to the Jews as well as to the Gentiles. Okay, so that is the claim that Jesus is making. And then again, he talks a little more about his relationship with the father. Uh, and he says things like, I, uh, the father loves me because I lay down my life. So indirectly, what is he saying? Again, that he is a shepherd. He already said directly, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. Now again, he's saying indirectly that he's the good shepherd who lays down his life. Um, and then he says that I may take it again. So uh, when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus, okay, I lay down my life so that I may take it again. Take it again is what? Third day, he rose from the dead. If we look at scriptures, you know, there are uh, verses that tell us that the father raised the son from the dead. We see also that the Holy Spirit uh, uh, provided that power for raising Jesus from the dead. Now, here in this verse, verse 17, Jesus is claiming and he's saying, I lay down my life that I may take it again. So who is working in the resurrection of Christ? The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three are at work for the demonstration of the resurrection from the dead of Jesus. And that is something that he is giving them. It's a prophetic word. He's telling them this is going to happen. I lay down my life so that I can take it up again. Then he says, nobody takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. So it's a willing sacrifice. In leadership, what does God want from us? God wants us to lead sacrificially, but with our hearts, uh, you know, open towards God. It's not that God forces us to lead people. No, it's a willing heart. And in this case, Jesus says, of my own will, I'm going to lay down uh, my life. And, you know, I, uh, I have the power to lay it down and have the power to take it again. So uh, he's willingly going to lay down his life. Now, when he was speaking these things, they were so upset. They already must have been upset because he was calling them as uh, false leaders or shepherds who were bad shepherds. So that must have irritated the religious leaders already. But what irritated them more was he starting to claim his relationship with the father now. So all this put together, you know, again, they wanted to make him look like Something is wrong with him. So this time, what do they say? You know, they tell him or they say about him, he has a demon. Why do you listen to him? As if Jesus was speaking uh, senseless things. Okay, So they could not prove that he's a sinner. They tried it. It didn't work. Mm, now they're trying to prove that he's mad or you know he has a demon. So let's see how this goes. Now, in the camp of the um, Jews, some of them were very bent on proving Jesus wrong. But then you have the others also. What are they doing? You know, they uh, continue to believe that something about this man is special. So they ask themselves the question. You know, the others, they ask this question. They say, mm, these are not the words of one who has a demon. You know, how can wise words come out of the mouth of um, a demon-possessed person. 
or a mad person. So I, we don't think this Jesus is mad or demon possessed. Now, uh, moving, let's just keep going on and you know uh, see what what are all the things that Jesus is saying. Now, again, in the temple, you, know, you find Jesus going to the temple, and uh, over there, um, uh, he's kind of you know walking around. There is the feast of dedication going on at that time. So is Jesus afraid of the religious leaders? No. Otherwise, what would he have done? He would have hidden. He was not afraid. So he went to the temple and he was walking around there and they find him and they ask him the question. Uh, they say, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. You know, this question is very funny because till now, what are we discussing? Jesus openly he is saying I am from above openly he is saying that if you drink of me you will not thirst openly he is saying you know I am the bread of life I am the light of the world and then uh, you know I am uh, before Abraham was I am that was you know the cherry on the cake the moment you say I am it's like for the Jewish people it was a blasphemy how can you compare yourself with God so is this not direct enough directly He's been telling them, no, I am the good shepherd, I am the door. And now what are they asking him again? Because their hearts are hard. They are looking for an answer from him where he would say that I am not the son of God. But how can he say that when he is the son of God? So they are pushing him to um, take back his claims. And it's very funny. They are saying, how long do you keep us in doubt? Where is the doubt? Things are so clear. Then they are saying, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So hardness of heart. Now Jesus said, right? Blindness. Blindness. What blindness is? A spiritual blindness. Though they see, they are not able to, uh, they are, like, you know, they are not able to perceive things. So that is the condition of these Pharisees. So Jesus responds to them. He's telling them, look, I already told you, but you didn't believe. Okay, come on. Now let me make it clearer for you. He says, okay, so if you don't believe the claims, so once he did, made all his claims, what are they telling him? You're mad. You have a demon. That is their conclusion. So he's saying, okay, fine. You know, Leave that aside. Leave my claims aside. The works that I do uh, in my father's name, they bear, they bear witness of me. So he's saying, look, a human being, like a person, right? How do we uh, know who that person is? By the words which they speak and the works which they do, right? Uh, now, how about you shift the focus to the works which I have done? What works are these? These are the father's works okay these are the works that jesus has done in the name of the father and we've seen that you know how he claims i do what the father tells me to do all that so he's doing only the father's work so he shifts the focus on the works okay come on don't worry about my claims let's look at the works what i've done he say these works they bear witness of me so even the blind man asked you know how can a sinner uh, sinner's prayer be heard. How can somebody who is blind all their life receive sight if he was a sinner? And in this passage, you know, John 10, some of the Jews, you know, they are saying that how can he have a demon? You know, if uh, uh, he's doing all these miracles and saying all these wonderful things, how can this man have a demon? So Jesus is saying, okay, come on, look at the works for some time. They bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Okay? So basically, he's telling them again that, you know, you are not willing. That is the reason you are not able to see the truth, even if the truth is in front of you. So <laughs> he says, uh, um, verse 29, my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. So uh, he's saying that um, the people who believe, right? The people who believe that they are the sheep who hear his voice 
and that the father has given those people to jesus and jesus is going to preserve them now even when uh, this passage is talked about so there is a uh, there is an association of this passage with the concept of predestination but people say that ha huh, there are only some uh, human beings whom god has chosen to be part of the kingdom so that is why when the gospel is preached some respond others don't it's based on god's predestination but you know if we talk about predestination what i shared about the free will of man that uh, uh, will not hold true so how can the same god give free will and also control the will of people it's not possible isn't it so this passage when we read this passage <coughs> we have to remember that it does not override free will of god even though it sounds like it sounds like you know these uh, people whom the father has given me um uh, nobody will be able to snatch them from my father's hand uh, and all of that it is the choice of the people the those who believe in in god you know, they are the ones who become uh, they are the ones who uh, are instilled with the ability to hear the father's voice so what is jesus doing now he said okay i made all these claims you did not believe but the works that i do in my father's name they bear witness of me so believe the works even if you don't believe the claims believe the works so till now what are the works we have seen you know we saw the water which was turned into wine we saw a noble man okay a noble man he came to jesus and his his son isn't it yeah son was sick the very hour jesus spoke he got healed then what else did we see we saw the man at the pool of bethsaida he also 38 years he was ill uh, he could not walk he was paralyzed and uh, <coughs> now he he rose up okay when jesus ministered to him so these are the works of jesus and recently we saw a blind man from birth now having looked at the works how can anybody have a doubt that jesus is the messiah that's the question that jesus is asking them and he's saying if you don't believe my words you believe the works that i do you okay, just hold on guys yeah so uh, he is pointing to his works so the supernatural works of god must lead us to god and uh, earlier we said that uh, uh, we need more of the supernatural works of god in today's church because if you go by how jesus is speaking one is preaching okay where the claims of jesus we we proclaim that he is the messiah uh, you know we declare all those things so wonderful yeah great but in addition to that the works of the father you know when the works of the father are done even that will be an evidence that god is real you know, imagine we pray for somebody and uh, uh, they are healed or we pray for somebody and they were in a uh, financial difficulty and they were blessed you know these things show that god is real <clears throat> the moment you pray uh, the moment you minister god's power is being released into that situation so what will be the response of the people the people will be amazed and they'll be like wow you know this has to be god how can how can it not be god so the works in today's church we need the emphasis on both preaching as well as the supernatural demonstrations of the works of god okay because you see even jesus did that he he drew the attention of the people to the works he said if you don't believe what i'm saying how about you look at my works and then you talk so the works bear witness of who jesus is and so 
all of us we have to pray god in our life in our ministry in our um, uh, you know uh, in the church in every way that god you know we that we be able for oh god to demonstrate your supernatural works now let's keep looking forward now uh, one thing that jesus said made them very very upset he said in the end verse 30 i and my father are one okay so this is again a claim that jesus is making where he is saying i am god or i am deity and the father you know how can you how can a mere man claim equality till now the i am statements are also uh, for the jews they were blasphemous this statement i and my father are one it's like jesus is saying i have the same nature flowing through me okay it's <clears throat> in the uh, language if you look up the language the greek in which jesus said this uh, it was not like jesus was saying you know sometimes we can say my father and i are one so maybe my father's attitude is like my attitude or uh, you know my father's behavior is like my my behavior so we are one not in purpose not in character not in mission but the greek there is to uh, point out that they are one in nature so how can a human being be one with creator god there again is another claim of jesus where he is saying that i am the messiah so time and again you know jesus was claiming if you want to put it this way in his ministry <clears throat> he was preaching about himself that's what our what is a great commission oh all the world you know make disciples uh, baptizing them in the name of the father son and the holy spirit and then you know you teach them all things that i have taught you so it's always about jesus all the time even during his ministry he was trying to reveal himself as messiah to the people today what are we doing that is our job we are revealing jesus as a messiah to the people okay so he is claiming boldly is claiming i and my father are one same nature we have so i am the messiah and this you know really really upset the jews and the jews how upset were they you know when they stoned people during jesus times it was to kill them because uh, stoning is it's like a brutal punishment so what do they do when jesus says makes the claim they took up stones to stone him then jesus answered many good works i have shown you from my father for which one of those works do you stone me you know in whatever jesus is speaking there is so much logic but you know when there's hardness of heart logic does logic only doesn't make sense so these people they are not uh, ready to accept the right and the good so what is the response of the jews they're saying see not for any good work we are not stoning you for that you know why we are stoning you blast for me because you are a man and you are claiming equality with god how can you do that hmm? so that was the issue for uh, the jews so they are ready to stone him so jesus tries to explain himself once again you know he says look in scripture it already calls us as gods okay uh, there is a you know there, there is a passage of uh, scripture where we are uh, the people of god are called as gods so he saying when that scripture you can accept okay how is it that you're not accepting what i am saying and then he is adding to the case that he is making about himself and he is saying look if i do not do the works of my father don't believe do not believe me okay let's stop at this and what do you think about this statement this is i'll tell you verse uh, 
37. So John 10 verse 37. I post it here in the chat. Okay. What any any thoughts about the statement? If I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. What does it show? Uh, yeah, Dave, any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, the thing is, Jesus, uh, whatever he did, he was doing what God and, and his father asked him to do. He says, I, I don't speak a word apart from, uh, from my own self. I do what he, uh, the father says, uh, so I do what he says. So in a sense here, uh, if you look at the works I did, if the works weren't told by my father, I, I was not doing. So if you, if you really want to believe, if you want to believe or if you don't want to believe, look, look at the works I did. The works all were done because my father asked me to do or he showed me what to do. So you, have, you believe on the works. If you believe on the works, that means you believe on the Father, on, on God, that I, I've been sent by Father, I've been sent by God to do what He asked me to do. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, Dave, thank you for that. So you're saying that um, the works of the Father reveal the relationship of Jesus with the Father and um, Jesus has done what the Father has asked him to do, isn't it? Is that your point? Yes, ma'am, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, yes, that's true. So, he has done the Father's works, shows his obedience. Uh, so, that is uh, something we can get from this verse. Uh, anything else that uh, comes to your mind? I listed out, no? All the miraculous things that Jesus did, through which he revealed his glory. Those are the Father's works. If I do not do the works of my Father, or if he does not reveal the glory of God, then he's going to the extent of saying, don't believe me. So in the ministry of Jesus, he's preaching, <clears throat> He is teaching, but he is also demonstrating the kingdom. Okay, You see the importance of that. He has gone to the extent of saying, suppose, okay, minus, minus the glory of God through all these supernatural works. Separate, separate those things. If I only speak and if you don't see the power of God, don't believe me. So what can we take from it? as ministers of God today, same thing applies to us. We can speak all about God. <clears throat> we can talk about the kingdom of God. But you know, scripture also says that the kingdom of God is not all, uh, you know, talking. But it is a demonstration of power. So, we have to be hungry for the glory of God. Okay? We have to be hungry for the works of God to be re revealed in people's lives. So when we are doing ministry, you know, whether it is our church, let's say I'm a pastor of the church, and I must desire, God, let the people encounter you in such a way that you know, your glory is revealed in their life, you know, your power is revealed in their life, so that you know, we see all these miracles, we see all these signs, we see wonders, we see healings, we see demons being cast out. All that should be happening. If it's not happening, it's like what Jesus is saying here. He says, if I don't do the works of my father. So if these things are not there, then how can people put their faith? 
So along with our preaching, we must see the demonstration of the kingdom of God. Okay, so that's the additional point which I wanted to make here. So very clearly, <clears throat> Jesus is emphasizing the supernatural. And verse 38, he says, but if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Again, so verse 38 is also, it's strongly saying the same thing. It says, believe the works because these works are pointing you to the Father. They're pointing you to me. They're pointing you that the Father and I are one. So uh, the demonstration of God's power is very, very important uh, through all our lives, <clears throat> particularly those of us who are in ministry. Okay. So when Jesus was saying all these things, they got very, very upset. First, they tried to stone him. Now they decide, okay, better to just get him or seize him. Seize him is catch him. But we are told that Jesus escaped when they tried to catch him. And he went away beyond the Jordan to a place where John was baptizing at first and he stayed there. Then many came to him <clears throat> and said, uh, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. Again, you know, many believed in him there. So you see, like a little bit of a contrast, you could say in, in, a, in a way, John did not have miraculous signs. At least that's what we are told. Or people uh, are, are talking about John and they're saying he did not perform any miraculous signs. But what is the good thing about the ministry of John? He pointed to Jesus faithfully, okay, uh, in a true way. Because the people are saying, whatever he spoke about this man, it was true. So when we preach about Jesus, you know, we must preach in such a way that it points people to Jesus. And at the same time, you know, the reality, the truth about Jesus, truth about Jesus. Uh, and so that people can put their trust in him. People can put their faith in him. Okay, so um, these are all, this is how the, the situation was around Jesus. The situation was in the region at that time. So basically Jesus is just trying to buy some time uh, <clears throat> before things get worse and he uh, is caught and they put him on trial. So he's continuing the works of the father. Now he went away uh, somewhere near Jordan and uh, John the Baptist, that, that was the region where John the Baptist was doing his work. So uh, he stayed there for some time. Now, the next incident that takes place is also a work of the father. It's a miraculous work. And, uh, uh, you know, we talk so much about the next uh, chapter here because it was about Jesus and his good friends. Okay, we have Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, and uh, you all must be aware. So what happened was when Jesus was away, Lazarus became very sick. Okay, And uh, <clears throat> uh, Jesus was uh, not there at the time. Uh, and he was very sick. And the sisters were trying to take care of him. Uh, and then they sent word to Jesus. Okay, they went sent word to Jesus uh, that he's sick. So what do we expect? We expect Jesus to show up, right? We expect Jesus to hurry up and come. But when Jesus heard about it, you know, he makes a statement. He says, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So Jesus was aware by the Spirit about the resurrection of Lazarus. So he is prophetically saying that, that this man, he is not going to die, but he is going to live for the glory of God. Uh, and soon enough, you know, uh, the sick man, he actually died. And scriptures tell us uh, <clears throat> when he heard that Lazarus was sick, in verse 6, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. You know, again, Thinking about the life of Jesus, uh, we recognize that he was so obedient to the Father. He was led by the Father, even his timing. No, he didn't rush. What would you and I do? 
the moment we hear ah you have to go there for ministry you have to go preach somebody is sick we run but how did jesus take it he took it by god's time table so why did he stay back two days and he already told he already told that this sickness uh, it's not unto death but for the glory of god so he probably knew that lazarus is going to die and that he would have to resurrect him but why did he let lazarus die and that's a question we have uh, however you know so far we've understood that he goes by what the father tells him to do so he is simply obeying the father so whatever happens in the case of lazarus the father is leading him so jesus is going to go by that time table so he stays back two more days uh, and after this right he says okay come now let's go let's go back to our region judea uh, and let's go and meet them once again you know uh, as he is planning to go to judea the disciples are afraid why because already jesus escaped from there uh, because of the opposition that is rising against him because of the persecution which is rising against him uh, and they are asking him jesus why do you want to go there don't you know the jews already tried to stone you but jesus you know points out and he tells them that you know uh, uh, i have nothing to be afraid of i am the person who is walking in the light and i have nothing to be afraid of so basically uh, jesus is walking confidently with the father and he knows the timings isn't it he already made that statement and you know he he said that the time is not right even though these jews are trying to kill him they will not be able to catch him because that hour has not come so uh, he was clear that him going to judea is not going to result in his immediate um, arrest and you know the uh, things that take place after that so he's just trying to tell his disciples that hey hold on you know nothing will happen let's go ahead uh, and uh, there's nothing that i need to be afraid of so as he was saying these things he also adds okay he says well, our friend lazarus sleeps but i go that i may wake him up so there was a purpose jesus was not afraid of being um, ill treated by the jews but at the same time jesus is saying there is a reason why i have to go to uh, judea and that is to wake up lazarus okay and the words which jesus is using here sleeps for he sleeps you know in the bible <clears throat> we are told that the believers are asleep in the lord and there is going to be a resurrection when jesus returns okay jesus is aware of that once he is he dies on the cross that will be the destiny of every believer that they will not die uh, in this physical world death is not like completely destructive because there is going to be a resurrection so in similar terms you know he says lazarus is sleeping and we are going there to wake him up now obviously by uh, you know right now jesus had not yet made the sacrifice so this was not a, uh, a result of the cross but we see the foretaste of the cross in the works that jesus did even before the cross he is able to raise up somebody who has died so you know, jesus is saying lazarus is only asleep and we are going to raise him up the disciples you know they don't discern the words of jesus in a spiritual sense so they they ask him back and they say lord if he is sleeping why can't we just let him sleep because uh, he will get better isn't it but jesus knew that he was talking about sleep you know he he equated death with sleep because he knew that he is going to resurrect lazarus and with this understanding 
Now Jesus was speaking. So finally, Jesus tells them, okay, you um, disciples, you're not understanding what I'm saying. What I'm saying is Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So he clearly tells them that Lazarus is dead, but he does not seem to reveal you know, what is going to happen after that. But Jesus knows that he is going to raise up Lazarus. Okay. Uh, and Thomas, you know, Thomas makes a statement there. Uh, he says to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. You know, it's like some self-sacrificial statement where, uh, you know, Thomas is showing his devotion to Jesus. Uh, but, you know, even after Jesus clearly told that Lazarus is dead, the disciples are not fully able to understand what he is saying. So, you know, uh, so far we have seen that, you know, God is leading Jesus in his mighty works. That is quite clear that we are seeing that Jesus is going by God's timetable. So looking at the Lazarus story, you know, we can apply it to our own lives in certain situations and circumstances and wonder, God, why is the intervention, why is your intervention taking longer than what we expected? Why didn't the intervention come when the situation was bad? You know, the intervention seems to be coming when the situation is worse. But at those times, we can remember the way Jesus said, look, this is happening for our sakes so that we might be able to see the glory of God. Right? So certain times there is, I'm not saying that every delay um, is, is like the Lazarus delay. Because there can be some delays which are demonic in nature, right? Which we must fight against, which we must pray against, which we cannot uh, say that, okay, you know, this delay is happening and God is uh, intervening in this circumstance in a, uh, in a special sort of a way. No, the key is to discern by the Holy Spirit. In this circumstance, is the delay because God is going to do something very wonderful after I have uh, gone through some stages or you discern by the Holy Spirit. Is this delay a demonic opposition? If the delay is a demonic opposition, what do we do? We have to press past it. We have to fight against it. Right? So the discerning of why the delay is happening is very important. Everything we cannot put a stamp and say, oh, God is delaying. So it will be like the resurrection of Lazarus. No, it doesn't work like that. Okay? But that discerning spirit is required. In the case of Lazarus, Jesus was very clear. He already told them, Lazarus is asleep. We are going to uh, wake him up. So Jesus was clear that this man is going to come back to life. Right? So um, I hope that uh, you, know, you have gained something out of this. And what we'll do is we will stop at this point because uh, we run out of time. Uh, we'll try and cover maybe two to three chapters every class. And that way, uh, we will be able to complete the book of John. So it's very interesting. The resurrection of Lazarus, we'll come back to it next week and uh, explain it further. So shall we just pray and close class? Uh, would like to request somebody to pray. Mm. Again, Aran, do you mind? Can we, could you pray again? Yeah, sure, sure, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Father, for for the learning, Lord Father, well, from the book of John, Lord Father. Whatever we have understood from the word, Lord Father, help us to um, apply this in our daily walk with you, Lord. And Lord Father, Lord, uh, whatever circumstances or whatever mountains that we are facing, Lord Father, help us to overcome this uh, with you, Lord Father. Jesus, and I pray that, Lord Father, I pray for all these students and all the, uh, yes, Lord Father, whatever we have. Lord Father. Okay, I think Aran has uh, been disconnected. I'll just quickly say a word of prayer. Let's close. 
Uh, Father God, thank you, Lord, once again for this time. Thank you for every word. Thank you for every student. Father, we pray that you will continue to shine the light, Lord, of your revelation upon our hearts. Transform us. Help us, oh God, to, um, uh, Lord, uh, walk in a more committed way with you, Father God. Lord, we give ourselves into your hands. Thank you uh, for everything, Lord, that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, yeah. Amen. God bless. Take care. Have a blessed day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.